Hello, and uh, welcome again to one of our lovely meetings. Um, we are here uh, again. It's, um, it's uh, me, Luis, and uh, our lovely two guests, Nuno Cunha and Nuno Serra. And today, we're going to talk about funding. So one of the things that uh, a lot of people talk about or ask about is like, oh, I have my XR startup, huh? but I have no money. How can I get things? How can I do things? How can I get people to work with me? And uh, what should I do? So um, there's a lot of stuff that uh, you can do um, as a startup um, owner, co-founder, or whatever you want to call yourself. And um, today we hope to enlighten you in, in a few um, of those paths, because there are many. Um, there are, there's a lot of literature on, on the subject, and there's a lot of things that you can already look for on the webs. Um, but I'm pretty sure that uh, both of our Nunus uh, will uh, give us some more uh, insights into what are the opportunities there, especially for uh, getting, um, well, the money. So without further ado, um, Nunu. You have the stage. Okay, thank you. So I guess that's uh, me. <laughs> yeah. Very well. So I'm sharing the screen with a prepared presentation. So um, I'm going to talk about how to fund an immersive startup in Europe, uh, specifically on public funding programs for research, uh, development, and innovation. So for short, uh, known as RDI funding, in this case, specifically tailored for um, AR, VR, or other immersive solutions. So I wanted to uh, give you um, a glimpse of the existing programs in terms of uh, European funding. And the question uh, to answer is, uh, does your company or your project or your startup complies uh, with the public funding criteria? And I want to give you a broad view of the criteria and requirements uh, that are necessary uh, to fund the project in this program. So the goal for today uh, is to give you all a high-level helicopter view and an introduction to the main aspects uh, and key issues about the EU funding programs with a specific focus uh, on uh, innovation, R&D-based immersive projects. So my agenda for today is to give you some key concepts first, um, the main baseline issues, and then I'm going to talk about European funding programs, uh, specifically Horizon 2020. Uh, one Portuguese uh, funding program, Portugal 2020, with a brief comparison with Horizon 2020 and some examples of uh, funded immersive projects and probably the subject that is the most interesting, where are the opportunities for funding right now? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about ourselves. So. Starting with the key concepts, the, the main challenge for startups uh, in tackling these programs is, of course, high complexity. There are hundreds of funding calls uh, across all the EU um, yearly. Uh, there are a lot of different programs. They have different structures, different priorities. Uh, there are several rules for project types, different eligible expenses. It's quite a complex maze, and this is uh, getting worse. It's changing for the next seven years uh, with the new program. Uh, just to give you an illustration uh, or a sample of European programs, uh, this is not to be read. Uh, it's just a sample of some of the European funding programs that exist for um, cohesion, agriculture, for technology, for education and culture, and for research, innovation, and competitiveness. I'm only going to talk about Horizon 2020 uh, in this slide that is here. So uh, this is just to give you an idea of um, the number of programs that can exist across all of Europe. The motivation or the why these programs exist and one of the key issues to be answered by the projects is um, the motivation of being globally competitive. One simple slide, uh, this is uh, from 2014. Um, this slide compares the um, intensity of investment in uh, RDI versus the GDP growth. 
And what it says is that Europe, in average, um, you can see in the left, uh, the averages for the European 28, so this was before Brexit, uh, it was below 2% of GDP. So in average, uh, the European countries invest um, around the 2% of the total GDP in research, development, and innovation. When we compare that to the, um, the right hand uh, of the screen, you can see that in South Korea and Japan and the United States, the level of investment is higher, not only in this year, but it's cumulative higher in all the preceding years. And um, as far as I know, it was very similar, this proportion uh, since 2013 until today. So there is a gap uh, in historical funding, and it can be uh, vis it, it is visible in the in the level of competitiveness in these countries. There is one country that is not in this graphic, uh, which is China. Uh, it was below the European level in 2014, and it has um, uh, surpassed Europe uh, in terms of this relative investment recently. I think it was in 2016 or 2017. So basic motivation, uh, global competition. So for short, any project must be uh, globally competitive. But there are more uh, key issues, the European dilemma and gaps. The European dilemma is known as uh, this contrast between research excellence, on one hand, um, huge research capability, but on the other hand, a relative weakness in the exploitation uh, of those innovations, uh, of those technologies into innovations. So uh, this is a different version of the value of death, which is a uh, research uh, project or uh, technology development projects that do not reach the market. But there are other motivations for these programs, which are gaps in competitiveness, as we already said, uh, scientific gaps, uh, technical, economical, social, regional, uh, human gaps, uh, etc. Some of these can be explained in the deficit uh, versus USA, Japan, or Korea but also the deficit between European regions and regional or structural programs such as part of uh, Portugal 2020, uh, lack of critical mass of, or resources, and of course societal challenges like demographic changes, um, security, environmental issues. Overall, the funding programs uh, that end this year in 2020 have a greater focus on the transfer of research results to the, to the market. To keep in mind, uh, usually the European funding programs are non-dilutive. Uh, this means that they are constituted by grants, uh, not by equity. Uh, not by funds that need to be reimbursed. So a grant is an amount that is received uh, by the project uh, almost as um, profit. Uh, no, it's not profit. But uh, there are strings attached to this type of funding, to this type of advantage. Um, first, there are contractual obligations, for example, to keep uh, created shops uh, to keep uh, investments uh, for a period of years. Uh, for example, in most structural funds, uh, if you create a job or if you perform an investment, uh, you are obliged to keep that uh, job or that investment in the same country or in the same region for a period of some years. Other strings attached are high uh, objectives, high ambition of the objectives in European programs. So there's always a catch uh, associated with uh, the benefit of, uh, of the funding. So it's, uh, it's not free money. Uh, it has uh, uh, something that needs to be uh, done uh, as a result of receiving European funding. Also, uh, it is important to take into account that public funding comes in several forms. It can be subsidies for research grants, uh, for scholarships, uh, lump sums for events or for reaching um, a certain deliverable, uh, soft loan, uh, which is a loan without interests and commissions, so it's only loan per, per loan basis. But again, it's a trade-off for something. 
um, uh, like uh, disruptive innovation, creation of jobs, uh, breakthroughs in science, uh, or making high risk technological developments such as a brilliant immersive project or a new immersive application, for example. It also can have different characteristics. For example, uh, geographic focus, uh, Portugal 2020 only covers Portugal. Uh, Horizon 2020 for the European 28 and some other uh, geographic um, uh, regions can apply to Horizon 2020. Uh, the objectives uh, are R&D, uh, technology transfer, demonstrations, create jobs, innovation or education and others. The scope in technological or operational terms can be very different. Uh, it can be robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, AR, VR, energy, factories, and health, and many others. And the eligible expenses can fall in different categories. Uh, there are more details to this. I'm being very brief, uh, but it can be content, funding audiovisual content, um, R&D work and related costs. Uh, human resources costs, investments in CAPEX, investments in IP protection, travel events, and others, many others. So these are just some uh, key concepts to keep in mind before I start describing the actual uh, funding programs. I'm going to start by the European ones. Uh, the first uh, is Horizon 2020. Uh, it concentrates most of the efforts in Europe that are dedicated to R&D at European level, at European scope. Um, it is, or it was, approximately 80,000 million euros, or billions if you want to use the American convention, uh, for a period of the last seven years. Uh, one note about the next program, uh, it was known this morning uh, that the next program, which is called Horizon Europe, will have more or less uh, the same financial dimension for um, start next year and ending in 2027. Uh, and by the way, this program, while we're having some differences, uh, it is expected that several of the instruments that I'm going to talk about are going to continue next year and uh, beyond. But for all aspects, the presentation that I'm making today is for Horizon 2020, current European programs, and the current opportunities and calls. Um, I'm not going to, uh, into many details about this uh, specific program. Um, the most important aspect is that most projects are done in consortia and not individually. Uh, while most of the projects uh, are funded um, by grant, um, in one case, there is an equity option. And uh, most of the funding is, in terms of percentage-wise, is 100% or 70%. Uh, there is a division uh, in terms of the programs uh, or the focus, which is sometimes horizontal, uh, like um, information technology. So the program ICT is information and communication technology, so it's horizontal with multiple types of applications, or vertical, such as health. The structure of um, Horizon 2020 itself, uh, it's in uh, these uh, blocks. Uh, excellent science, industrial leadership, and societal challenges. Uh, but I'll go to the next one. The eligibility of R&D for these programs um, is defined uh, mostly has a significant advance versus what already exists in the market or what is already known in scientific and technological terms. So only a fraction of the R&D uh, that can be carried out in some area as a fit and can be funded by Horizon 2020 programs. The time to market is usually defined in the calls with a TRL range. Um, that means a time to market in terms of technological maturity that is illustrated in the image and means essentially if it is to the uh, left, um, it's too immature, it's technology or scientific aspects that still need to be developed until they reach um, the market. And to the right, uh, a TRL level 9 is the maximum level. It's a uh, technology or a product in the market uh, already developed and operating. 
Uh, as you can see below, uh, the Horizon 2020 program funds practically all this scope from TRL levels, um, almost one until nine, actually until eight, but in practice some projects end up in a, a level close to TRL nine. Now for some examples, um, these are uh, projects taken out from the database of funded projects uh, and some of their participants. So most of them were uh, consortium based projects. And I guess that some of them are very well known uh, companies. Uh, as you can see here, the topics are diverse. Uh, there are projects, yeah. Is it working? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Is it better now? Okay, thanks. So as you can see here, there have been uh, funded projects in the area of sports goods, uh, textiles, um, cellulose packaging, heating and cooling, um, solar energy, animal health, uh, robots for warehouses, production processes, energy systems, biomarkers, and open innovation for healthcare. Uh, it's, by the way, it's not an accident that we have several American multinationals uh, in this uh, consortia. Uh, those are the establishments in Europe of um, IBM, uh, of Microsoft, uh, and others. As long as the projects are developed in Europe and investments are made in Europe, uh, this is uh, perfectly uh, acceptable and normal, by the way. So, just to give you a glimpse, um, there are several different types of uh, projects and they have different funding rates and different uh, rules, different objectives. The most common are the research and innovation actions or um, RIAs. They are 100% funded. They are mostly focused on uh, research uh, with a low TRL level and they are all collaborative, meaning that are in consortia. They need to have at least three uh, independent legal entities from three different member states or associated countries. And um, the other type of project is innovation action, which normally it's a higher TRL, so closer to the market. It can be uh, ended in um, a product or a process uh, that is highly improved and almost ready to go to the market. And since it is closer to the market, it has a funding rate of 70%. Um, coordination action uh, is funded 100% uh, and it deals with um, support measures for research, such as standards, events, um, uh, policy dialogues, and so on, but not research. Uh, I will talk about the other two, the Acceleration and the FTIs uh, later, but I'm not going to refer several um, instruments like the prizes, Marie Curie, etc., because there are, there are too many. I would spend the entire afternoon talking about all of them. So, talking about programs. Uh, and specific calls. The most interesting for this community is obviously not a program, but a project, the XR for All call. Um, you can find all the link in the XR for All EU open call information. Uh, the main point is there is an open call uh, until the end of December, uh, to mid December, sorry. Uh, it is uh, aimed to uh, stimulate the development uh, of new applications or new plugins for XR, meaning uh, all the immersive technologies. Uh, it is uh, intended to boost the adoption of XR technologies uh, by researcher teams or startup teams. And the projects themselves uh, must be formatted in two stages. Um, stage one concept validation, uh, two months for 10K of funding, 10,000 euros. And the stage two development and integration, uh, so actual technical development in this part for four months uh, with 40K funding. So this is an example of two things. Uh, first, the XR for All is a project funded by Horizon 2020. 
I think it's a project of the type um, IA, an innovation action, uh, if I recall correctly, that provides this call in order to have additional participants that are going to be the startups or research teams that uh, will be invited to execute these um, six months 50k projects. The total funding for these calls is um, 1.5 million. Uh, they expect a maximum of uh, 50 projects uh, in the in the two in the accumulated of the two stages. And there were already two stages uh, of this uh, call um, done in the past: one that ended in December and one that ended um, recently, a couple of weeks ago. So. In this case, the requirements uh, for the um, projects that uh, apply to the funding is to build a solution, a plugin for games, for example, or um, related uh, something related with interactive uh, technologies, augmented reality applications, mixed reality or similar immersive technologies. I think uh, here we can fit almost anything that we have in this uh, community in terms of projects and uh, make use of a platform that was developed by this uh, consortium with some uh, tools uh, and systems specifically dedicated to XR development. Now, the accelerator is a different uh, type of funding. Uh, it was known previously as the SME instrument, uh, which has uh, had some uh, changes. Uh, basically, it's directed to the small business, uh, small uh, startup Valley of Pet uh, that uh, lies in the intersection of the um, research programs uh, and the market. And the commission is looking for companies that are close to market, international, and have the potential to be high growth, very disruptive, very scalable uh, with their current product or service prototypes. The... Funding uh, for this program uh, is one of the few examples that has uh, diluted funding in Horizon 2020. As far as I know, it's the only one. So the funding is um, a, blended, uh, op a blended funding of a grant op uh, and optionally an equity portion. The grant can be up to 2.5 million euros, uh, considering a funding rate of 70%. And the equity option can be up to 15 million. So again, this is for uh, individual SMEs, not for consortia, only one SME can apply and they need to have high risk, high growth potential aiming at creating new markets or significantly disrupt disrupting existing markets. This is very competitive and past calls have had a um, success rate of 3%, 4%. This means that only three to 4% of the projects that applied have been funded. Uh, for obvious reasons, this is a very compelling and interesting funding uh, option for startups. So the result is that by each call, um, thousands uh, of companies apply. A similar but different um, instrument for funding is the fast track to innovation. Uh, it's very similar in terms of trying to uh, break through, uh, trying to fund breakthrough products, services, or business processes and reduce the time from idea to market. The main difference is that um, this must be presented by a consortium of three to five partners where industry must be majority and the participants can also be large companies. In fact, most of the applications, as far as I know, are from large participants. Uh, again, like the accelerator, it's bottom up, meaning that uh, projects can be presented coming from all sectors. Uh, all technologies, uh, any kind of product, service, or new business model is acceptable. There is no predefined area of focus like uh, we have seen in the call for the XR for All project. There, only immersive projects can be submitted. Here is the op opposite. You can have projects from health, environment, ICT, and so on. And they all compete for the same, for the same budget. Uh, another difference is that the maximum budget is 3 million, 
uh, at the same funding rate of 70%, and there is no equity option like in the Excel rate. Now, changing a bit uh, into um, different programs, uh, there, are, or, there are also two programs that I think are interesting for this community, that is Erasmus Plus and Media. Unfortunately, most of these calls are closed, so they will not be present uh, when I'll talk about the open opportunities. But I have some expectation that in 2021, uh, similar types uh, of calls are going to be launched. Um, the examples that I have here are from uh, February 2019 for audiovisual production, so development of content, uh, development of films, documentaries, and other uh, creatives, creations, and for video games. Erasmus Plus is um, educational projects in consortia, for example, for capacity building, sector skills, and knowledge. And since one of the um, applications of immersive technologies uh, is um, education or um, entertainment mixed with education, if you prefer, uh, it can be an interesting option for, uh, for some projects. Now, about Portugal 2020 and briefly comparing with Horizon 2020, uh, Portugal 2020 is a very different uh, funding program. It has um, a regional focus uh, in Portugal and um, it has different priorities in each different region. So priorities for the Lisbon region are different than the priorities for North and Central regions and Alentejo and so on. Uh, so they are a good example of regional structural funds. The priorities are national, regional innovation or innovation at company level. So as you may remember from Horizon 2020, the priority is um, innovation at the global level, competitiveness at the global level. And here uh, it's, um, it's a striking difference. The types of calls are, unlike Horizon 2020, mostly individual uh, in innovation focused in entrepreneurship or SMEs. Um, we also have R&D project in consortia, but there is also an individual modality. Uh, internationalization or business development support for, um, for SMEs, uh, small and medium enterprises. The qualification of SMEs. And the biggest difference uh, is um, the funding rate. Uh, for SMEs and startups, it can be between 25% to 75%. But this wide, uh, this varies widely uh, with the type of call. Uh, the rate is determined uh, depending on the call, on the project type, uh, on the company type and size investments that are being presented. Uh, so it can the there is no fixed uh, percentage for each project. It is calculated on a project per project basis, and it can be some quite complex in some cases. The type of funding uh, is uh, mixed in terms of um, refundable and non the non-refundable option uh, because uh, several uh, programs are funded by soft loans. So briefly comparing these, um, Horizon 2020 uh, in contrast is European-wide R&D. Uh, the priorities are global. Um, the types of instruments are different, um, well, are similar, but the frame of reference for evaluation is, uh, is global and the consortium calls are the majority of these. And of course, the funding is much higher. So this is um, a significant difference. Now, some examples of funded immersive projects. I guess that many of you know Glartech. Uh, which very briefly, uh, it's a tool for industry to interact and to perform uh, maintenance and tasks with the support with, uh, aug of augmented reality. Uh, so it lies in the intersection uh, of two worlds, which are monitoring systems and setup and maintenance uh, teams. And it was funded by uh, Horizon 2020 projects, uh, sorry, grants. Another company is uh, Visualizer that was previously known as uh, VD Room. Uh, it's um, 360 solutions uh, for uh, digital assets, um, smart media, media management. And uh, this was funded uh, by Portugal 2020. 
Another company uh, that was funded by multiple programs, uh, Infinite Foundry, was very successful uh, in attracting uh, uh, both European and national uh, funding uh, uh, projects. Uh, it's a 3D digital plant platform for improved uh, production efficiency uh, in any industrial sector. So they use uh, 3D modeling, um, virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, digital twins. Uh, it's a um, complex and very interesting uh, platform. They also have an application for eye competition sport, uh, virtual 3D training applied to sport. I'm not sure if we still have the time to show the video. Are you okay? Are we okay with time or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll show a snippet of the video. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so here is a demonstration for the um, virtual fight simulator, probably not the most political correct um uh, example but here you can see some examples of recording of strikes uh, that are being modeled in the platform and being followed in the computer uh, essentially several sensors are registering the motion and translating this uh, to the coaches and to the athlete uh, himself or herself in order to improve performance so this is all used with um, or all compatible with AR options. So I will just s jump a bit to the to this option where you can see the athlete uh, make having a visualization of an opponent in real time, and some well calibration and uh, testing exercises that uh, were performed while developing the solution in a training academy. And I'll jump back to the presentation. Uh, I think we'll make the, the link uh, available so that any interested can uh, see later and maybe wish uh, this is a hint for you. Maybe they are an interesting company to uh, perform a, web, a webcast just by themselves about their technology. But entirely up to you, huh? no pressure. You should def definitely have them because it looks really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I spoke when I was in LA, I spoke with a friend of mine. He's a former a uh, strike force uh, fighter and uh, we were discussing uh how should how could we do something like this so this is something mm -hmm. really that needs to get out there mm -hmm. and the interesting thing for me is that the technology was um, developed to do monitoring in factories car factories um well I think uh, you will need to go to mars to uh, imagine an environment that is so far removed from sports well, continuing, um, probably the most interesting part for some companies uh, that are uh, listening, the future calls and opportunities for funding. There are some European opportunities uh, still open, even if 2020 is the last year for uh, European programs. Um, uh, I did not talk about the Eurostars program, which is the first in the list, and is, uh, the next deadline is in the 3rd of September. Uh, because Eurostars is a strange hybrid between European and national programs. Uh, it is uh, managed at European level, but the funding uh, comes from individual countries. So it lies exactly in the middle. But like the Accelerator and the FTI, it's um, bottom up, uh, open for any kind of project, uh, open to innovative projects led by research and development performing SMEs. Um, the consortia uh, is uh, required that it can be two organizations, uh, but at least from two different countries that participate in, uh, in Eurostars. And um, we hope that this program will continue in 2021. The XR for all call, as we already discussed, will end uh, in, uh, in the 15th of December. So this will be the last opportunity to apply for this program. And the project ends, uh, so there will be no further calls of XR for all. The accelerator um, will continue in 2021. It's still to be confirmed, uh, like the other to uh, calls for Horizon 2020 that I have in this slide, but it's highly likely that it will continue. 
But if you have a disruptive uh, innovation project, you can still submit it until uh, the 7th of October. The Innovation Associate, uh, it's a different um, kind of funding, uh, is a funding program to perform an exchange um, of a, um, a PhD. So if you know a European PhD uh, in other country that's not Portugal and you want to hire that person to work in your immersive team, uh, this can be a good option uh, to get a scholarship for that person. So this is very similar to the Marie Curie or Marie Slolovska Curie uh, grants uh, that are very used by universities, but this is the um, company version uh, or company friendly version uh, of that scheme. And um, it is likely to open in early 2021. The FTI, Fast Track Innovation, has the last call in um, the 27th of October, and it's also expected to continue in the next years in Horizon 2020 programs, uh, which will continue under the name of Horizon Europe, naturally. In Portugal, uh, in Portugal 2020, unfortunately, most of the calls are already closed. There are a few remaining. Um, the first one, this R&D demonstration, is a demonstration project, but it's limited to companies that have had a good score, a good classification in the Horizon 2020 accelerator. So um, this is only for companies that already had a seal of excellence, uh, which is a kind of a quality seal uh, of, um, of this uh, Horizon 2020 evaluation. Uh, by the way, sometimes we have these uh, schemes that have a connection between European programs and the, um, the regional or national programs. So this is a good example of a um, Portuguese program that funds projects that have been approved or received a high score uh, in uh, European programs. Now, for some regions, um, which are called low density uh, regions uh, in the interior of Portugal. Uh, there are some calls for productive innovation, uh, hiring of highly qualified resources, for example, PhDs, um, R&D uh, in a consortium and to hire human resources uh, during this year. Uh, so um, there are still some opportunities left, uh, even if the timing uh, is a bit uh, strict for some of them. And, uh, of course, that everything is up to be defined for the next years until 2027. Uh, the expectation is that the new program uh, was, uh, since the overall uh, financial framework for Europe was approved today, uh, the funds are there and they are going to be programmed and defined along the next month. So hopefully in 2021, we'll have more calls in the successor of Portugal 2020. A bit about us, uh, I feel that I'm uh, a bit out of time, but uh, essentially we join funding expertise with strategy and business planning and knowledge about R&D execution and technology expertise. Uh, we have had more than 25 uh, funded projects for our customers, more than 14 million euros in uh, funding acquired. Uh, we are always searching for um, startups or SMEs in these areas, particularly in ICT, um, artificial intelligence, and also industrial environments and earth observation or space, either to join the consortium that we are supporting or to um, support uh, their projects. And since I'm a bit uh, since I'm a bit out of time, I will uh, leave it like here. My contacts are in the presentation, so feel free to contact me. And Louise, I accept your protest for exceeding the time. <laughs> Sorry, not an issue. Um, thank you very much, Nunu. Thank you very much for uh, uh, well sharing all of this uh, and also showing that our kickboxing moves can be improved. Um, overall, I think maybe yours, not mine, for sure. But. <laughs> mine for sure uh, but yeah uh, it, it really is great uh, to see uh, that there are so many uh, options so many possibilities for us to um, well to develop and to uh, improve our funding and my kid just arrived <laughs> from school <laughs> say hi hi and so uh, coming up uh, so it's Nunu uh, 
yet another Nuno, Nuno Serra. Oh, uh, just uh, just uh, uh, a quick mention that uh, a VRAR, um, you are a VRARA member and you are actually our specialist in... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. In <laughs> So, yes, uh, yeah, uh, if you need any kind of, uh, uh, again, support referring to, uh, well, the, these kind of, uh, uh, of programs, feel free to contact, well, uh, all pretty much all the contacts that uh, Nunu just shared. Uh, we will also be sharing those on the, uh, on the chat. And, uh, of course, if you want to come in also afterwards, and um, and just contact both me, Tiago, and Ezio uh, directly. Well, we'll be happy to to point Nunu's way. Uh, but again, coming up. Okay. Uh, Thanks, <laughs> Nunu. From Nunu Cunha to Nunu Serra, uh, that heads the operations. Nunu, thank you very much for for uh, being here with us. And thank you very uh, much for the invitation. Um, I also prepared a short presentation. Um, I'll keep it brief so that everyone gets a chance to, to ask some questions. Um, so I'm Nuno Serra, Head of Operations at Building Global Innovators. Um, BGI uh, started as a, a initiative, a joint initiative between the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the Portuguese government and we have been operating as the hub for Europe, scouting for European companies to take to the US. Um, that's not about that that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to discuss how can you get uh, other kinds of funding in Europe. And uh, specifically, if we talk about Portugal, I uh, invite you to read uh, something that we have been producing for the last uh, three to four years uh, in partnership with EIT Digital, European Institute of Innovation and Technology, and specifically the private-public partnership for digital uh, companies. Um, so uh, in this startup outlook, you can find some KPIs, uh, not only about the companies that are supported by, by BGI, but all the startups operating in the digital space in Portugal. We also have uh, the scale-up uh, scale report, which is uh, a selection of the 25 most promising scale-ups uh, in Portugal. So some key messages from this report we know that Portugal still uh, lags significantly when compared to other uh, European countries, but we have been uh, having a positive evolution. Uh, the second key point is that most of the money still comes from abroad. And if I uh, am to compare uh, these numbers, uh, which are global for Portugal with companies supported by BGI, it's even uh, more um, evident. So 80% of the money that uh, we get uh, for our companies, and it has been around 300 million in these last 10 years, still comes from the US. Also, um, we see investors being, uh, well, targeting uh, some industries that uh, are uh, higher risk, but that can bring also high returns on the long run. So at top of the list, we have healthcare with a multiple of eight times, and then transportation and then media. So uh, these uh, industries are also relevant for this community. When we compare um, the average um, deal uh, between Portugal, Europe, and the US, we can still find a huge uh, gap. And uh, the two spikes you see in Portugal were very big deals that were not common. So we are talking about uh, out systems, and uh, I think it's uh, Pizza or something, I'm not sure, but such big deals can really have an impact on the average deal size. Um, if we look at the 
the share of funding by industry, information technology, it's at the top with almost 50% of all the, the funding uh, that was uh, given to companies. Uh, but if we look at revenue, revenue generated, then it's a very different story. So uh, we have, uh, for instance, healthcare services uh, down below, it's uh, second to last. But uh, as I mentioned, it's top in terms of transaction multiples. So this is the kind of analysis we do uh, on an aggregate um, group of companies uh, and we uh, compare different uh, industries um, in Portugal. So uh, jumping into the big question, why should you open capital to your investors? And the simple answer is to grow. You need to grow, you need fuel to do that. And people have money uh, hidden in bags and you want people to take the bags and put, it, uh, put them on top of the table and give you to multiply to get more money. So this is the big reason. Uh, then uh, the kind of investor you should be looking for uh, will depend on the stage of development of your company. So if you are a startup, don't go and ask for banks for loans. Uh, most probably you will get a no. Uh, and also you are not ready to go public. So you will resort to different kinds of uh, support entities that can uh, finance your venture in the first stages. And from all of those, and of course, Nuno Cunha already talked about government programs, um, I would highlight incubators and innovation hubs and accelerators um, because they give you more than money. They will also open you uh, open new connections to the ecosystem and put you in contact with potential partners and customers. So these would be the most valuable uh, partners you uh, may uh, have in the first stages of development. And of course, also some business angels to give you small amounts of money and also uh, bring their experience uh, and help you with some things you may not be used to. So uh, now looking at Europe, first I talked about Portugal, then let's see some numbers about Europe. And the key message here is that the deal size has been uh, growing and uh, what was previously a series A investment, now probably we call it a seed funding. So uh, the investors are putting more money in each deal and they are uh, combining uh, different investors in the syndicate to put more money into companies. Still, Europe uh, has a different deal size than the United States, for instance. You can multiply these numbers probably by two. Uh, if you are looking for one million in Europe, uh, in the US you'll probably get two million but a uh, very ambitious plan. So how much of the total money invested goes into each type of round? And here what we see is that angel and seed investment has been decreasing. Uh, this means that investors are putting more money into more mature companies and they are not financing as much uh, earlier stage companies as before. And this is also very important for you to understand um, because you either grow very fast or probably you'll get out of funding options very soon. Also looking at uh, different sectors, and this is for Europe, um, we see that most money is put into software. And then we have other kinds of uh, investments. Uh, so uh, if we look at software and 
uh, the aggregate of all other that are not specified here, we have the two biggest categories. Uh, and uh, we uh, are looking at relative sizes. So this is percentual, but you see that most money is still put into software. So what are investors looking for? And the first and most obvious answer is their money back with multiples. So keep this in mind when we go through the next slide and see that also they look for a great project, uh, a great market opportunity, and also a great team. Um, if you ask me between the three, what would wait a bit more for an investor? Well, if you have a great project, but the team is not the right one, then you're not able to monetize it. So uh, the risk is higher. If you have a small market opportunity, then it doesn't matter how good you are uh, because you are aiming for something that is already very small. So the key thing here is great people. If you are uh, coachable, flexible, if you are willing to pivot many times in the process, then probably you uh, appeal more to investors because even if you are not targeting the right market or you don't have the right project or technology, eventually you'll get there and they will be betting more on people than on specific technology. On the investors uh, side, there are so many uh, asymmetries. So uh, when, an, when you approach an investor, in the investor's mind, there's one uh, simple question. I know that you are uh, misleading me, uh, you are lying to me, I just don't know how much. So uh, let's find out. And by lying, I'm not saying that you will be uh, doing that on purpose, but uh, you will be, uh, of course, giving uh, your projections, your assumptions, and probably they're not right. So this is the kind of challenge that the investor faces. So in order for you to get along with an investor, you should be always very transparent and highlight what are the key variables that affect your projections and what were the assumptions that you made when you built them so that uh, the other side understands the risks and is able to uh, value uh, correctly. Now, um, well, we are not uh, in a setting that allows us to, uh, to make questions, open questions for everyone, but uh, think uh, what is the main cause of failure? Uh, and you already have so many identified here. And actually, the greatest source of failure is no, no market need. So, 42% of the times, uh, the companies that fail had beautiful products, good teams, um, but there was no market need. So this is exactly where you should start when talking uh, with an investor. It's showing that there is an actual market need. And then you move to the other questions. Okay, so now going through the typical process and this is sequential and you should not jump uh, steps. So first you should gather some data about investors and then research them thoroughly because they will also uh, decide whether to invest or not in you uh, based on uh, other uh, factors like the overall fit with their uh, objectives and their other portfolio companies, if there are synergies or not, if they are, if you are competing uh, against someone that is already invested by them. So you should be a very caref careful researching investors. And then you create the pitch deck. And then you need to contact investors, build a relationship and have the opportunity to pitch. 
though uh, pitching 1,000 times uh, will only get you very tired. Uh, you should be very uh, sharp and focused on the kinds of uh, investors you want to pitch to. Um, after pitching, you typically think that it's done, he was happy, he will invest in us, but then a whole new process starts, which is then you start developing the relationship you created with them, and uh, eventually they will give you a term sheet. And then you need to understand in full what these uh, conditions and terms in the term sheet uh, all mean to you and which ones are usual and you, you should accept them and which ones are unusual and probably you should renegotiate them or uh, go for another investor. Yes, because there are also investors that put things in term sheets that are not good for both parties. So you should uh, move away from a bad term sheet. Then if everything goes well, uh, you go through due diligence. And then if you survive it, uh, you close the round. So this, this process typically takes from a few months to more than a year. So you should start planning ahead and not wait uh, until the last one or two months to uh, engage with investors. And this will be my last slide. Uh, these are the typical questions that you should be able to answer. First, why should I care? Uh, is there a market need? I already talked a bit about this and the importance of answering this first question. Then, uh, and uh, actually this is where companies usually have most slides about is what do you do? So you talk about your marvelous product and technology and all the good things that you have in the pipeline, but you don't provide information about uh, what do you do in terms that investors can understand. You need to uh, make it very simple, very clear, because this is only the second out of 10 questions you need to answer. So you should not uh, get stuck here and spend uh, all your time discussing what you, what you have now. So the third question is, why will you win? Why it's you and not? Uh, what, what is unique about your solution that uh, will uh, make you win? And also this helps answering the next question is, how will you stay ahead? Uh, how sustainable is this uh, uniqueness? And then uh, you should provide proof that all the things that you said you do, that actually work. How uh, users and customers view this kind of solution and what proof, what tests have you done that validate that uh, the technology works? And then you are only halfway. Um, then you need to, to describe how you will make money. And this is the discussion about the business model and all your financial assumptions. And of course, how much will you make? It's a consequence of that. And then uh, you need to uh, also explain why you personally, your team, your advisors, your partners, uh, how this whole structure will uh, give assurance to investors that you are the ones capable of taking this to the market. And then uh, what will you do? That's the roadmap and the milestones uh, and all the good things you, you want to accomplish. And then you need to explain how much will it cost. So this is exactly when you say, I'm asking for 2 million to go from stage A to stage B, and then I will need six more to go to stage C. This should be uh, delivered in, uh, I would say, five to 10 minutes or less. Uh, sometimes we train companies to provide 
very short answers to these questions in less than three minutes. So you're not asking for a one hour meeting. You just ask for one hour meeting to go into the details with the specialists also on their side. Uh, so you should be able to go through all this very quickly and then open for questions. And also this contributes to developing the relationship you need because this works uh, like a marriage, but a lot deeper. So you are not living together, but you are using other people's money. So that's the kind of intimacy that uh, you will have with your investors. So the next step is show me the money. This is what you need uh, to, to aim for when you start uh, engaging with investors. Don't do it unless you mean it. And if you mean it, uh, you should do all it takes to get to the pot of money at the end of the rainbow. So um, I'm done with the presentation. Now let's uh, hopefully get some questions, some comments from you. And thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Nun. Thank uh, you, Nun. Yeah, meaningful thank relationships you. with investors. It's uh, the very, a, a very important issue that sometimes keeps on being um, well ignored. <laughs> yeah, we were saying sorry. No, no, I was just saying thank you, Nunu and Nunu, for 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 uh, the um, for our presentations. Uh, they, they cover a lot of interesting points. And I have a few questions for you guys. Um, so one of the things that I usually notice is um, a lot of uh, startup founders, I have no idea what the money they're looking for is in terms of what it correlates in terms of um, value for the investors. So they have no idea, usually, well, not everyone does this, obviously, but a lot of them have no idea that, for instance, if their uh, business is something that makes sense for uh, equity investment, or uh, how should they proceed on a, on a first investment round, and probably they've never heard of convertible notes or some other stuff that is really crucial for a lot of people so that they don't get screwed right from the first round. So um, what would you say um, are the key questions for uh, each and every one of these founders uh, that they should make uh, when looking to get uh, money? Whether it's um, seed, whether it's VC, whether, I mean, they, they want to start and they need some money to back up their, their ideas what are the first, let's call it three questions that they should make regarding their own business? Well, maybe I should take this. Uh, well, the first question, and I think uh, it was very clear for everyone, is am I able to give the money back with multiples? So we are not researching. We are not experimenting. Of course, there is a lot of risk involved but when I go uh, and ask for some kind of investor for them, their money, it can be a business angel or a VC, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I need to understand if uh, I'm being true to myself and to the investor uh, in being able to pay him back. So this is probably the most uh, important thing we should think about. Um, Prior to this, of course, we have friends, family, founders, and fools. Uh, and of course, people who like us give us money just because we have an idea and uh, they want to take part in this journey. And if they are uh, uh, lucky, they will get some money in return, but they're not making a sound and well thought investment decision. If you approach accelerators and they give you money and they also give you other support, probably they will 
uh, not ask for equity up front. They will ask you for uh, some kind of uh, future option. So if I give you 50K uh, and you go through my accelerator, um, then uh, when you reach a valuation of 3 million, or if you uh, have revenues of 3 million, then I exercise the right and I take 6% of in equity. And then I will become your shareholder, not before. So this is a more flexible kind of arrangement that you can have uh, early stage um, that will uh, keep you alive until you reach the moment of uh, being positive about giving the money back to investors. Yeah, but, but you know, the, the, there's a problem there that I see uh, so very often, which is um, no reason in um, entrepreneurs, they have no idea uh, about what should, um, what's a decent take on the equity part. And I've seen a lot of this, those so-called accelerators willing to take like 10% for a couple of thousand euros. And that's just utter bullshit because uh, no one should take that. But a lot of people, they don't know that. And I've seen cases where, where you take like 60% cuts in future options for uh, five figure digits. Again, this is stupid. Uh, so what should, and, 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 and for some of these companies, probably, they don't even need BC. They probably can get along with other stuff. So uh, my question yeah. was more you, in the lines you touched, of... You touched the nerve. Yeah. And actually, this is something that uh, over and over again, we need to fix in some companies that did that in the first stages of development. So imagine, and this is a real case, a company developing a new drug that just completed clinical trials phase one, and, the, and they are uh, now uh, getting funded for phase two, and it's in the range of 10 to 20 million. And uh, founders uh, already own less than 20% of the whole company. This is a major red flag no new investor will put money into a company where founders are so diluted and the company will need to raise more money in the future. So this capitalization table issue, uh, this is uh, how we call it uh, to be, uh, well, to, to say the least, uh, we don't see, it. We, we should, call it very stupid decisions early in the process. So when we reach a stage like this, we need to make a change. And change is painful for investors, but ultimately it will be also in their benefit. So uh, if I have one piece of advice for you is don't get diluted so early in the process. It will kill your company in the future. Yeah, I know so many companies especially from the early 2000s who went on on a few dodgy investment schemes and uh, i call it schemes <laughs> because they, they 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 do get that and then their their business um even though it, it was a good and sound business proposal it, it just died as soon as they they signed that contract so i think it's it's very important for uh, us to have more um, education into what investment is like and uh, how, um, what are the sound and sustainable ways, not only to get money, but to also wrap hold of your equity and, and, and take control of your company, at least in the, in, in the early stages uh, of the investment, because no one will make it to a, a series A <laughs> if they do the, that, it, it, it's just, God, you know, but that, but thanks, thanks your comment. If I may, Tiago, um, yeah. one of the public funding solutions for that problem, uh, being non-dilutive, uh, are public funding programs naturally. 
uh, and some of them are particularly well suited for projects that are mature and almost ready to go to the market. The accelerator that we discussed before, uh, it's a good option and it includes uh, an equity part in case the companies are also ready to go in that uh, stage. Um, the other programs um, from the point of view of startups are a bit more demanding and they are still a bit far from the market. For example, Eurostars is more research intensive and it's a consortium project. So in theory is not um, is not that close. But uh, for all purposes, uh, almost everything that uh, Nunu said and uh, the discussion that you have is applicable for the accelerator because those applications are indeed uh, uh, formatted has uh, an application uh, as a pitch for uh, for investors. They are, they are really very similar. And just to sum up the catch is, uh, it's very hard to get, uh, but uh, it's non-dilutive. So it does not create those kind of problems. Yeah, um, especially when we're talking about emerging technology like uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, yes. It's always hard, uh, I think, uh, not just to uh, have uh, a notion of what your runway is, uh, because uh, today maybe you have an idea that your runway is going to be in like nine months or one year, uh, but then suddenly uh, something happens in the market and technology changes and suddenly uh, you're, it's not like that anymore and you need to invest a lot more and uh, suddenly you're stuck uh, and you really need to uh, get funding fast. So uh, one of the things that I find, so right now we're talking about, well, again, Portuguese ecosystem and we're not like a uh, first, uh, first year uh, ecosystem like uh, London, like, uh, well, the US, New York, San Francisco. But uh, we, we do have uh, a really nice ecosystem that has a really nice talent pool that gets replenished, um, well, continuously uh, from Brazil, from Africa, from, uh, well, so many people that want to come here and enjoy the lifestyle. Um, and, uh, of course, um, going further and uh, investing in Portugal uh, and investing in a tech team in Portugal, it's much easier and softer uh, in, uh, uh, in the company's budget um, when compared, for instance, to London and New York. But one of the things that I find that is actually hindering the development of the ecosystem is that most of the investors in Portugal aren't really, uh, let's say, versed uh, in uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So sometimes uh, they are not uh, they, they are not against it, but as they not they don't really connect with the technology and with the possibilities and transformational possibilities that they have, and what they see is like kind of a um, crazy reports from uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper saying that uh, in ten years we'll have like X trillion kind of a <laughs> business depending on virtual reality and augmented reality. So suddenly they, um, they become not, uh, well, they're unsure. So my question is, how do you think that we can uh, improve the levels of, uh, uh, well, trust, trustfulness in this emerging technology uh, within the local investor community and also, well, pretty much uh, the all-around global investor community in uh, virtual reality and augmented reality being emerging technologies. Well, if I may go first, the hype cycle or the adoption cycle is always a tricky matter. Um, I remember start uh, talking uh, or looking about something that emerged as the smartphone as early as 1999 or 2000. And those are completely scenarios. And we had a notion at the time in some research projects that that's going to happen eventually. We don't know when, uh, we don't know how, uh, we don't know what is going to be the technology. Uh, but it happened, um, and it started to be fulfilled by the by the iPhone. 
uh, and for some for some specific matters by uh, some previous smartphones. The the point is, these things take time in terms of uh, inserting, uh, let's say, inserting uh, new uh, new technology and emerging technologies uh, in the markets. Uh, there is at least uh, in the public program framework. Um, a good uh, notion that uh, several technologies need to be supported before they get market ready and really um, supported uh, until they are uh, mature enough uh, to reach the market. So I'm not sure I answered to your question, Louise, but this is the, the best I can uh, I can let you know at this time. Sure, thank, thank you. It's, it's a good analysis. No, no. Yeah, uh, just adding some comments. Um, we are already seeing uh, companies in this uh, in these fields uh, succeed, and these are uh, opening the path for all the other companies that want to do the same. So instead of uh, thinking of other companies uh, as competitors, you can see them as door openers and they will educate the market. And then if you have a uniqueness, uh, then you will be also able to succeed because the market will open and will be bigger. So don't look at the size of the market today. Look at uh, the companies that are already succeeding and what's special about them. So this would be uh, also my advice. Don't look at the past, look at the future and follow the leaders good words to uh, the years of investors out there that are thinking about investing in uh, virtual reality augmented reality uh, and maybe considering coming to europe and maybe considering coming to this corner of europe uh, we have a question um so i'm going to read it um so uh being involved in several European programs uh, in the past, I always find uh, bureaucracy involved uh, to be uh, really complex for a normal startup, mainly uh, when it comes to um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the debt absence. Uh, with uh, so, uh, you need to uh, when you apply, you need to be debt free uh, regarding the tax authority and regarding the, the government. And uh, uh, also the, um, the bureaucratic burden is really, really heavy uh, when applying and, and throughout the process. So is this uh, on purpose? Is this something to going to change uh, any day? Uh, for a, a bootstrap startup, this can be really complicated. Uh, any suggestion from the speakers? Okay, I think that's one is for me. <laughs> Well, for the first part uh, about the absence of debt to the government, uh, that deals with compliance uh, with tax payments and payments to social security. Uh, so yes, that's going to be uh, kept for the future for sure. The general principle is that this is public money. Uh, this is uh, coming from um, everybody's taxes. So projects are being funded because they have some impact in terms of um, European competitiveness, uh, they are targeting health projects, which, for example, are very important nowadays, as we all know. Uh, they are targeting uh, disruptive technology that is going to benefit us all or to give us, or to give us jobs in the future. Um, and that's why I talked about the trade-off. Uh, there is some compensation for this public funding. And for sure uh, that the rules are going to be kept uh, because uh, no company that owns um, taxes or social security uh, charges or something similar to the government can be funded. For the second part, the bureaucracy is uh, related to this. It's a necessary evil. Uh, there have been several efforts in the past from the programs to simplify some procedures, but unfortunately, the the burden is uh, is very high for uh, several small companies. And um, I have to say that in terms of European programs, they are much simpler now uh, than they were in the past. So they have managed to simplify a lot of procedures related with the applications and project management. But alas, uh, unfortunately, it's still necessary a lot of uh, work uh, to manage the project. 
in terms of Portugal 2020, it is still excessive, in my opinion. The amount of information that is required in applications and in projects, um, it's, uh, it's really too much. And some of the information is not useful for, uh, for anyone. So in that regard, we still have a bit of learning to do with uh, European programs. Still, you can help with that, right? Yeah, I can help with that, but I can promise that uh, they're going to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there is no easy solution for uh, for bootstrap companies. Uh, sometimes uh, they can uh, they can learn to do it by themselves. Sometimes they can hire some support uh, in terms of um, the paperwork. Uh, some, several accountants are well versed in these matters. Um, we specialize in the applications, but of course, that we can help our customers in these matters too. Um, so the first option is one, learning how to do it. Uh, the second option is to hiring somebody, somebody to do it, or three, uh, having some kind of combination between one and two. Um, but regarding simplification for the future programs, uh, I can only answer to that when they are uh, when they are out. So in a, in a three, six or 12 months, I can answer to this question and to see if the matter remains the same or if, or if we are still in the same situation. Let's do a webinar then. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Uh, these oh, yeah. I, uh, we can do a seminar about uh, immersive uh, technologies to read the European Commission documentation. I'm sure that nobody is going to pay attention <laughs> to that. <laughs> Well, it kind of depends on the way that uh, we, we read them, right? Nunu, what, <laughs> yeah. what are your thoughts on this? Uh, are, is there any opportunity or any uh, good tip for you to share with the bootstrap startups and how to deal with bureaucracy? Yeah, well, usually we see this uh, in uh, early stage companies. Um, if they come from... Uh, research or enough of uh, the university, uh, then uh, it's normal that they already understand uh, the bureaucracy and uh, they can cope with it and they finance uh, very successfully the uh, first uh, stage of development using those funds. When you get to later stage companies and especially the ones that are already being uh, financed by VCs, for instance, they may see this kind of project as a distraction because the focus would be uh, to commercialize, to sell, and to uh, gain traction, to uh, have new partnerships. And this uh, research and innovation uh, activities can uh, be seen by investors as a distraction. So you need to explain very carefully how is this going to impact your uh, overall business plan and not only talk about uh, how much money you will get from this project. So this is something that I've seen also several times uh, and investors don't like grants because it, it has several ties, it can be distractive it can put you in contact with uh, other consortia um, and uh, take you out of sales and other partnerships that can be more beneficial to your growth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Just to complement what Nuno said, uh, that's true. The management overheads for a research or innovation project can be well... Uh, above 10%, 50% of the total of the project easily, uh, while a, let's say a commercial project or the normal activity of the company uh, would be um, let's say at least under 5% in terms of management overhead at least. Uh, so that's a significant difference. Uh, also, again, the strings attached or the activities that need to be done after the project is completed uh, and sometimes obligations towards uh, intellectual property are um, raise objections uh, from investors. Uh, for example, some programs limit the transfer of, proper, uh, of intellectual property 
from the country or region where it was funded, and that's a serious limitation for any investor. Uh, others limit uh, the um, capability of the founders to close shop uh, and uh, go elsewhere, and that is uh, and that, that is another issue that is also uh, analyzed in the considerations. There. <laughs> and suddenly I was bombed again, but still, uh, yes, uh, actually, so in, in the association, one of, our main, one of our main goals is to try and uh, promote the ecosystem in a way that uh, it makes sense for investors or bigger companies to consider uh, Portugal and uh, to, well, bet on our skills and uh, uh, bring more um, VR, AR development capability uh, into our midst. So, um, yeah, uh, our, our push right now uh, is not just on trying to um, gather and communicate our ecosystem internationally and also trying to uh, pass on also some skills uh, on to, well, uh, investors uh, in, in Portugal already here. Um, but also, uh, we, we also try and, and uh, uh, as uh, Nun Serra said, we also try and learn from uh, the, the good, solid examples that are starting to happen here in Portugal uh, related directly with VR and AR. And uh, there are really cool examples of, uh, uh, of what's happening. One of the good things, I guess, uh, about this community, not just in Portugal, but pretty much all around, is that it's a giving community. So um, the cool thing is that uh, we see a lot of, um, well, uh, sharing happening. Uh, so um, just before we, we wrap it up, I, I would just like to uh, do a, a small uh, screen share. Uh, so I have here, uh, so this is our, uh, yeah, so this is our presentation. So as you can see, it's a bit about what the VRAR Association is. Uh, and it's just to say that uh, it's the biggest global uh, association for professional association of uh, virtual and augmented reality organizations. And pretty much what we foster is growth, knowledge, and networking between these organizations. So at this point, we are around 4,500 uh, companies uh, and brands and schools working together. Uh, and by working together, I'm saying like interacting on a Slack uh, every day, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, getting in uh, uh, these kind of meetings uh, and um, furthermore, trying to interact also in uh, industry committees. So pretty much we work together in, at an international level to create um, standards. So to create and share best practices, not just between ourselves, but also with the market. So overall, we're talking about 28,000 professionals uh, that are interacting and uh, these professionals and uh, these organizations that are part of the VRAR Association go from startup level. You can also be like an individual and still be a member of uh, the association. And that goes up to uh, like big corporates, uh, like for instance, and as you can see, like Siemens, Lenovo, uh, Lenovo actually sponsored the last uh, VRAR Global Summit. So yeah, uh, big thing. But overall, our focus is um, yeah to promote, to uh, create knowledge and to share knowledge and also create uh, some accountability also on the side of uh, the companies, organizations and professionals that are developing these kind of solutions because we do believe that this is going to be uh, the um, digital format of the decade. So uh, at, on the other end of this decade, we, th we think that uh, virtual reality and augmented reality formats will probably be uh, the main or the most common uh, formats for uh, digital information. So this just to showcase uh, the 
Well, the where we are and uh, where the VRAR association is uh, spreaded. So a lot of chapters in Portugal. We only have one Portugal chapter in Spain. You have two: one in Barcelona, another one in Madrid. Uh, but this to say that uh, overall, we we are well right now more than seventy chapters um, in Portugal. Uh, we are operating uh, in uh, as a section of APDC, which is uh, the Portuguese Association for the Development of Communications. And uh, in that sense, we are pushing forward. Uh, well, our main projects, let's say like that, uh, are to develop like uh, one ecosystem report. So it's already being uh, pushed forward. And it's expected to be done in September 2020. So we will have an ecosystem report that will uh, list uh, all organizations in Portugal working with uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So not just companies, but also uh, uh, laboratories. Uh, we're talking about um, agencies, big corporates with uh, VR and AR departments working from uh, um, from Portugal to the world, like, for instance, uh, Siemens, so Miguel Paulo, which is uh, uh, the, the responsible for the XR initiative uh, in Siemens. Uh, that is, well, pretty much the, the initiative for the development, global development of uh, uh, XR solutions across the, the Siemens group. He's also part of our advisory board. Um, and, well, uh, we will be uh, happy to to showcase them and pretty much uh, all of the the other um, organizations uh, this coming September. And also this coming September, we will have the second uh, edition this year of the VRAR Global Summit. So last year, uh, sorry, uh, in June actually, in June first to the third, we actually had eighteen one eight. Uh, speakers, Portuguese speakers, uh, in this uh, summit. So it was really, really interesting to see uh, so many different speakers, like from uh, uh, Fundação Champalimau, that uh, uh, was talking about how they did uh, well an intervention uh, or a surgery, um, cancer surgery, using Microsoft Hollands to. Uh, Nosh, a telco that is right now working on uh, preparing VR and AR solutions for 5G, uh, to um, Axias, which is uh, a consultancy uh, that is working on training uh, solutions from Portugal. So a, a lot of different interesting uh, solutions uh, were presented in the last version and on the last edition of the summit. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, this coming edition. And at this point, everyone uh, that is listening, uh, well, if it's like uh, until September 1st, <laughs> uh, can actually register at the vrarglobalsummit.com. So you just go in there and you can register uh, to participate both as well uh, a registered participant and just to, well, uh, attend. But uh, you can also register as a sponsor or you can also register as a speaker. And then afterwards, you will be contacted by uh, the, the organization. So um, this just to say that uh, overall, uh, we are uh, inside the uh, VRARA Portugal pushing forward uh, the, the ecosystems communication abroad. And we do feel that one of the main issues at this point that uh, needs to be uh, developed is, uh, well, pretty much uh, the VRAR uh, startup scene. And that comes with startups. And we last year, we, um, we supported uh, the... Um, uh, we actually sponsored the uh, Startup Weekend uh, it was the first time that we had an immersive uh, technology edition of Spart Startup Weekend happened, and that happened in Lisbon. Hopefully that will happen also during this year. But uh, on the startup side, uh, everything is pretty much ongoing and we see uh, several other startups uh, growing and, and making their way. Uh, what would really help would be to uh, like having, uh, well, again, investors uh, that could be uh, ready also to uh, push forward uh, these 
uh, these startups and, uh, well, to boost our ecosystem. So I don't know with that tone, uh, if you want to uh, share some final thoughts uh, for us to wrap up. Well, um, it's a good thing that uh, the community is growing and that you are having this kind of uh, collaboration between uh, all your, so your associates um, please reach out if you see that there's something we can help you with. Um, not only because we are in Portugal, but because we are also globally connected and we can uh, provide support beyond Portugal. Perfect. Yeah, I think that uh, with so many opportunities for funding uh, projects related with um, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, communication technologies, and also uh, key applications like uh, education, um, well-being, um, the Green Deal. Uh, there are several opportunities for this ecosystem to participate in European programs, uh, which prioritizes the use of emerging technologies. So for sure, there are going to be many opportunities uh, now and in the future for, uh, for us to work together in this. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, Thanks again for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, both Nuno and Nuno's contacts are uh, right now shared on the chat uh, on, uh, uh, well, on, on YouTube uh, where you're seeing this. So you are more than welcome afterwards to contact and to see uh, the, the websites and uh, to well connect directly with them. So um, furthermore, uh, I just then have to say again, thank you very much uh, to both our speakers. Thank you very much also to uh, our member Dimersions that uh, supported us and helped us produce uh, this and pretty much all webinars. And then as you also, I know you're there. And uh, well, uh, and thank you all for seeing this. Uh, and uh, please, uh, if you have uh, any questions and if you if you feel that you can help uh, the ecosystem push forward, you are more than welcome just to well connect, reach out, and uh, well, I'm sure that uh, we will be uh, well, we will be uh, able to help, and we will ha be able to uh, develop something together. So, thank you very much again, and. Have a great day.